Hi, I'm Adam Summer. You're listening to the Yershami Talk podcast with the support of the Yeshivat Debar Yushalayim in Harnof, Jerusalem. This is Berachot chapter 2, Halacha 3. This is the second part of the Shir in, in Berachot, and we're getting into Tefillin and trying to understand the most amazing mitzvah, Tefillin, because again, the first mitzvah in the Torah is to know Hashem, and we're putting on Tefillin, and actually, when you wrap Tefillin, you're wrapping and writing one of the names of Hashem on the Tefillin, and there's all sorts of passages inside. There's four compartments with um, all sorts of special script that goes inside of it, and it really is like a mitzvah that has special antenna that really connects you to a Kodesh Baruch Hu. It's a very special tefillin uh, uh, mitzvah. And let's get into uh, a custom that the Amora Rabbi Yochanan had about tefillin and what you can see from Rabbi Yochanan on how seriously these gedolim of the day, and these great sages and these great masters of of Torah and Agadah and oral law were, were doing with regard to tefillin and how it should inspire us to get stronger with all of our mitzvahs. So the Gemara reads that Rabbi Yochanan acted as follows. In the winter, when his head was strong, he would constantly wear both tefillin. That's being basically on his arm and on the head. And the Gemara says that, but in the summer, when his head was not strong, he would wear only the tefillin of his arm constantly. Keep in mind, this is being referred to at a time when Rabbi Yochanan was very, very big. He was, at this point, very fat. So it's understandable that in a day where there's no air conditioning, that he would be adversely affected by the heat. So in the summer, his head would be too weak uh, to wear tefillin on it the whole day and he would just wear it on his arm the whole day. Now, there are other texts that are actually the opposite of ours, says the Pene Moshe, that in the summer when he had no concerns about his head, it says that Rabbi Yochanan even wore the head to fill in all day, but in the winter when he had concerns about his head, he only wore the hand to fill in all day. So uh, according to that version, uh, that would be about Rabbi Yochanan's sensitivity to the cold. That would preclude him from wearing the tefillin on the head because he needed to have a hat. So there are some virgins that actually just have it opposite. But the point is that uh, it's, it's trying to show a limit of his capability. And basically what this is trying to show is that Rabbi Yochanan is following the the great sage Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai's practice of never being without tefillin, so that basically that he would always be trying to have tefillin, even if he was having a hard time physically because of the climate, he was still trying to do the mitzvah. Now the Haredim says about this, that in Bavli Yoma 86a, Rabbi Yochanan is quoted as saying that he considers it a desecration of Hashem's name, for a distinguished person like himself to walk for Amot without tefillin. So the the idea here is that tefillin is such a powerful mitzvah, and these people were at such a high level that they could always do this mitzvah where they had a clean mind. They weren't thinking perverse thoughts. They weren't letting their mind wander. They were keeping their mind very in the moment and very present. And that's one of the key ideas that you have to take with, with the mitzvah of tefillin is that you want to stay disciplined with your mind. It's, it's really a big part of doing the mitzvah. We were talking about saying the Shema, that you have, to, you have to have discipline when you say it. You have to concentrate on the meaning. You can't allow a half sec that's a break to come about because it can ruin the mitzvah, it can ruin your kavana, it can ruin your intention, and then it doesn't count. And over here with tefillin, while you're wearing it, all your thoughts have to be clean. 
and you have to always maintain this. So if you're wearing it for the whole day, then you're having a whole day of just having purposeful thoughts that are connected in the moment that are not um, wandering to other things that are, are maybe, you know, sources from the Yetzirah. And it's, it's one of these things that people today don't do because people don't have that sort of discipline. These great masters would wear their tefillin the whole day and they would go and they would teach Torah and learn Torah all day. And they were that focused and disciplined. So it should inspire all of us to be more disciplined in how we behave and how we think. Because thinking is the start of all action. And if we're thinking clean thoughts, we can start to become more holy and more pious. And that's a idea that comes about in Masechet Shabbos in the Yerushalmi that there's a chain of holiness and that it starts with clean thoughts and clean and clean thinking. And then you could start to build up holiness and then you could start to build up piety. And then if you're pious, uh, you can you can get to Olam Haba and you can get to the day when the resurrection of the dead comes. But um, this is all starting from mastering the first step, which is to start to have self-control and self-discipline and then it's going to manifest into other things in your life like you know controlling your tongue and controlling your speech so one of the key ideas about tefillin and the takeaway is to try to always do it where you're having a clean body and you're having a clean mind and the Gemara now wants to talk about how Rabbi Yochanan could have worn tefillin uh the whole day and, and worn it constantly. The Gemara says, but is it not prohibited to wear tefillin at certain times on account of nakedness? Basically, they're asking, you know, what would happen in these situations when Rabbi Yochanan was not able to wear tefillin, like if he went to a bathhouse to bathe or he disrobed. So what would happen there? And the idea over there, says the Haredim, is that one who enters a section of bathhouse where people are undressed, it's prohibited to wear tefillin. And since Rabbi Yochanan surely needed to bathe occasionally, how can it be said that, like Rabbi Yochanan, he was never without tefillin? And actually, the same question could be asked, says the Haredim, about Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai and his disciple, Rabbi Eliezer. However, there were ten, there were Tanaim, says says the Haredim, whose disciples were no longer alive when the question was raised, so their actual practice could not be corroborated. And Rabbi Yochanan, however, was an Amara whose disciples were still living at the time this Gemara was composed, and the question was therefore raised specifically regarding Rabbi Yochanan, that you know about this practice and his his students clarifying this practice. So note that if Rabbi Yochanan removed his tefillin immediately before bathing within four amos of the bath, there would be, um, you know, there would be no difficulty since even one who never goes without tefillin must obviously remove them to bathe or relieve himself and to go to the bathroom. However, in Talmudic times, one who used a bathhouse had to disrobe sometime before he actually bathed. And the bathhouses contained three rooms back then. People were required to disrobe when they would enter, and that would be in the outermost room. And then they would carry their clothes to the next room, hand it to the attendants so it could be, you know, guarded. And after that, they would go to the innermost room where they would actually bathe. So the Gemara is basically asking within the structure of this kind of building, when Rabbi Yochanan used a bathhouse, he must have removed his tefillin as soon as he entered it, which would have required him to walk some distance to the actual bath. So that's really the question, says the Haredim, is that, you know, it seems to contradict the assertion that he was never without tefillin. So what's going on here? And the question is going to get resolved by one of the students of Rabbi Yochanan, 
who's going to explain the actual practice of how it worked. So Rabbi Chia Bar Abba said, Rabbi Yochanan would wear a bathrobe, I'm sorry, would wear a robe beneath his cloak whenever he would bathe. So even after removing the ordinary cloak in the undressing area of the bathhouse, he was able to continue wearing his tefillin because he was still covered by a robe. And the Gemara continues, says, only upon reaching the area of the bathhouse containing the bathhouse attendants, in other words, that's going to be the second of these three rooms, would he remove the tefillin and disrobe completely? In other words, that in this sort of way of doing it, where you're always covering up, that he remained with his tefillin until very shortly before he actually bathed. So that's a, a key idea here, and it just shows toward two things here. One is always toward guarding toward modesty. And the second thing that this shows is just how zealously the people of this day, the gedolim of this day, would cling to this mitzvah. This mitzvah was so important because the more you learn about this mitzvah of tefillin, the more you see how it's, it's interconnected with how reality works and your place in the universe. And that's why they really did not want to go without this. This is really an important mitzvah. And people, they take this mitzvah so casually. And, you know, with this mitzvah, if you look at the laws of trying to um, save something from a fire, you know, on Shabbat, like if you have a billion dollars in your in your house and, and um, you know, you have a fire going on in your house, are you allowed to go in your house and carry out the money? You're not. You're not allowed to. You have to let that billion dollars burn. And likewise over here, if you were very observant Jew and you wanted to do the mitzvahs, and somebody said, I'll pay you a billion dollars so you don't do the mitzvah of tefillin today. A lot of these religious gadolim, actually all of the religious gadolim, would not take the billion dollars. They would rather do the mitzvah of tefillin. So you can see the mitzvah of tefillin is even worth more than a billion dollars. The tefillin is so deep, you have no idea how deep it is. And the more you study it, and the more you start to look at the mysticism of it and the agotic parts that connect to it, you're going to see why this mitzvah is so valuable for you to do and why you can really take your level of existence and your metaphysical experience on this plane to another level when you start to do the mitzvah of tefillin because this, these are really like antenna that connect you to something much higher, and you're going to start to see things change in your life when you start to put on tefillin with, with real intention and kavana. And that's why, like Rabbi Yochanan, did not want to take these off. And he always did something to delay that so that he could wear it as long as possible. You have no idea how lucky you are to be born a Jew, that even if a Jew is at a very low level spiritually and not connected to religion at all, that there's still a part of him that that can connect to heaven and does connect to heaven, and that the Jew really transcends above just being the man of the earth. Humanity was created as, as dust and clay and earth, and the Jew, with the nefesh of the Jew, and being created as a Jew and doing the myth, especially doing the mitzvahs of the Jew, that you can start to elevate yourself so that you're not just a, a, a person that sleeps, walks, and goes to the bathroom and, and slaves away, you know, working to make a house mortgage payment, that you are doing something in your life where your soul and your spirit is connected with heaven and that you can actually start to influence heaven. The Jew has the power to start to influence heaven and to start to do something where you can start to rectify the creation. And a regular human being doesn't have that capacity at all. They just don't. And the mitzvahs are the channel to do that. And the tefillin 
is a antenna that can help you to start to connect to heaven in that higher way. So there's another version of uh, what happened with Rabbi Yochanan's practice from one of, one of his students. And the Gemara says that Rabbi Yitzhak said Rabbi Yochanan would continue to wear the tefillin until he reached the area where Yaakov, the bathhouse manager, stood. That, I guess, was the guy over there in Tiberias who ran the bathhouse. But basically what this is saying, says the Haredim, is that this is going to be the innermost room of the bathhouse, and he remained with the tefillin on his head until immediately before he bathed. So the Haredim is saying that Apparently, the bathhouse manager gave special permission for Rabbi Yochanan to enter the actual uh, bathing room while still clothed. And this way, in this way, Rabbi uh, Yitzhak disagrees with Rabbi Chia Bar Abba, who stated that Rabbi Yochanan would remove his tefillin in the middle of the room of the bathhouse. And according to Rabbi Yitzhak, he removed them only in the innermost room. But I don't think that you should look at it in terms of them even disagreeing. Perhaps uh, Rabbi Hia Bar Abba is talking about when Rabbi Yochanan went to a general bathhouse somewhere that's not in his hometown. And Rabbi Yitzhak is talking about when Rabbi Yochanan would go to the bathhouse by where he learned and lived and studied and taught. And he knew Yaakov, the bathhouse manager. So when he's in his hometown area and he saw Yaakov, the bathhouse manager, Yaakov gave him special permission to go into the last room. Continue. And, and the Gemara says, when Rabbi Yochanan emerged from bathing, they would give him his tefillin and they brought him the tefillin and he would commonly say the following, two chests traveled with the Jews for the 40 years they were in the wilderness the Ark of the Life Giver of Worlds, and the Casket of Joseph. And the peoples of the world, upon seeing this, would say to the Jews, What is the nature of these two chests? And the Jews would respond, This is Joseph's casket, together with the Ark of the Life Giver of the Worlds. And the peoples of the world would ridicule and laugh at the Jews, saying, can it be that a casket of a dead person is traveling together with the Ark of the Life Giver of the Worlds? And the Jews would prop properly respond, Yes, it is fitting for them to travel together because this one, Joseph, fulfilled that which is written on the tablets contained in that one. So let's unpack this a little bit and see how this works. The Yafe Mara is saying that uh, it is noteworthy that when at the end of the 40-year journey in the wilderness, Moses completed writing the first Torah scroll and he was commanded to, to, uh, commanded to place it in the ark. Thus, the expression, this one, fulfilled that which is written on in that one, uh, took on an expanded meaning to include that Joseph's having fulfilled all the dictates of the Torah. And basically what this is trying to say uh, is that Joseph lives on eternally and belongs near the Ark of the Life Giver of Worlds. And this is an agotic teaching, and it's trying to indicate that Joseph adhere adhered to and followed all the Ten Commandments and then all the mitzvot that are in the in the Humash itself and and presumably as well the oral law and and parts that came along with it so what's happening here uh, says the Haredim is that is that when the Jews encamped in the wilderness the Ark of the Life Giver of Worlds that's the Holy Ark of the Covenants that also had the the Luchos that they were in the Mishkan and in the camp of the Shekinah. And then you had Joseph's casket, which Moses uh, took out uh, with him when he left Egypt. And that was going to be over there in the camp with the Levim and Moshe Rabbeinu. Why would that be? Because you're not allowed 
any way to bring a corpse into the camp of the Shechina, and you're not allowed to bring a corpse into uh, the area where the Bet Hamigdash is. It's forbidden. You're not allowed to bring something to me into there. By the way, that's a reason why that when the Sota woman, if she were to be judged that way, and she were to drink the water, and uh, she were to be judged uh, negatively for having cheated, uh, they can see the veins and everything popping out, and they carry her away very, very quickly to basically kick her out of the area so that she doesn't die inside the the uh, the courtyard area, inside where the 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 building is, because you're not allowed to have a corpse in there. And there would be a little bit of a delay uh, if she didn't have any merit for having learned Torah or no Torah. There would there'd be a slight delay, just enough time to get her out of there, says the Yershalmi, so that it wouldn't bring um, a corpse and contaminate where the Shechina is. So it's a very big idea there that why the Ark would be separated out from where the where the uh, the body of Joseph was, and the the Yafemara says that when they traveled, the Mishkan and its courtyard were composed, uh, which composed the camp of the Shkina, would be disassembled, and then once it's disassembled, the restriction against bringing corpses near the Ark would be temporarily lift tempor temporarily lifted during their travels. And then Joseph's casket will be placed next to the ark. Well, here we are today, and you know people still make fun of the traditions of the Jews. People still mock the Jews and the the way uh, Judaism is constructed. And this is no different today, and it's no different from back then. But the Jews have an answer, and the Jews are eternal, and we are still here. And there's something special about Judaism that it can't be destroyed. And even though the nations will will try to press us down and 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 hurt us and and try to take away our souls and try to take away our children and our money and our opportunities, we're still here. And we can and only with connecting directly to the Torah and Hashem can we survive. But we have answers for every question that the cynics have. Just like when when we were in the wilderness, we had answers, and we do today as well. And if you're challenged with uh, some heretic, or if you're challenged with somebody from another religion, there are always people in the Haredi community who have answers to all of their challenges and questions. So... Maybe you don't know the answer, but contact your rabbi, maybe at Asha Torah or, or Sameach or Devar Yushalayim, or find a Haredi rabbi. By the way, uh, the Belza uh, organization has a great uh, movement for Kirov, and they can get you all the answers as well. Also, if you go to Chabad, where it's a mainstream version of Chabad, they can also get you the answers. If you're looking also to become a Baal Tshuva, it's a great place to do it. And if you want to get into um, Breslev, Rabbi Arush, who was a student of Rabbi Horowitz and went to Devar Yushalayim, that's also a good mainstream version of Breslev, where they'll be getting you to study Gemara and not dance on buses. And they'll be giving you uh, part of the tradition. And it's a, it's a good real place. Uh, his yeshiva over there, and there's a lot of very good teachers over there. But the thing that you should know is that we always have answers, and we can always prove everything in the scripture. Unlike in Christianity, where they'll change the text, or they have to rewrite the text, or they have to modify the text, or they'll show you one piece over here and another piece over there. They won't actually show you um, the whole thing. Uh, that's why they'll sit there and they'll only look at Isaiah 53, where it talks about the servant, the suffering servant. Except when you read in Devarim, Devarim defines what is the servant. The servant is Am Yisrael. And then you define the servant in all the other chapters earlier in Isaiah, 
where it says uh, the servant is the Jewish people. But they won't show you that. They'll only show you the suffering servant in Isaiah 53, and they'll say it's our guy. It's a, it's a joke. But anyway, the Haredi people always have answers. They will get you the right person to give the right response and prove it to you. That's the difference. It's not going to just give you a response. They're going to give you a proof for it, and you'll be able to understand it. And they'll open up the scripture and, and the Gemara and the Tanakh, and they're going to be able to show you line by line why it is the way it is. So there are always answers. And just like there were always challenges back then, there will always be challenges, except after the days the Mashiach comes. But for now, uh, you can always find answers to any one of these uh, questions that challenge Judaism. There is always an answer. The Gemara now wants to question and wants to know about exiting the bath. What would happen after Rabbi Yochanan left? So the Gemara said, and why would Rabbi Yochanan mention this matter upon exiting the bath? And there's an answer. Rabbi Hanina said, it was in order to speak words of Torah. In other words, what's happening is when he's in the bath, you're not allowed to speak Torah matters. And when you exit, he would he would immediately uh, once he was in a in a proper condition, be able to start talking and teaching um, words of Torah. But there there has to be some fine points there because um, you you have to be careful. You're, you're not supposed to think about um, Torah in a in a place that might not be clean, and you have to be very careful about um, you know doing things with nakedness and like that. So. Rabbi Mana has a challenge here and says to him, but is it indeed so? Did Rabbi Yochanan have no other matter of Torah to say besides this one? In other words, what this is saying is, this is saying, you know, why would he choose to repeat this particular teaching each and every time he merged and, you know, came out of the bath and he's brought his tefillin? And Rabbi, Rabbi Matt is going to give another explanation for what happened here. Uh, the Gemara reads, rather, Rabbi Yochanan's words were intended as a rebuke. He meant to say to those listening, Joseph did not merit ascending to the rulership of Egypt for any reason, except that he observed the mitzvahs of the Holy One, blessed is he, and we similarly did not merit all this honor that we receive except on account of the fact that we have observed the mitzvahs of the Holy One, blessed is He, and you wish to deprive, deprive us of our observance of the mitzvahs. So the Haredim says about this that uh, there were always prominent goyim enjoying the bathhouse facilities when Rabbi Yochanan was there. And when donning his tefillin in, in, the pre, in their presence, he would relate this agotic teaching about Joseph in order to convey his rebuke to the Roman government, which often issued decrees against the observances of mitzvot. So that is going to be, you know, one of these mitzvahs where, you know, they would often try to forbid you from wearing tefillin. So... He would be making a, you know, a slap at them for trying to take away mitzvah observance. And the Pnei Moshe says about this that Rabbi Yochanan would say this on the occasions when he was forced to wait for us to fill in. And the bathhouse attendants were often busy dealing with other customers. So sometimes they would delay in bringing him to fill in. And to convey this displeasure, he would relate how the scrupulous observance of mitzvahs brings in its wake elevation of prominence. And basically, says the Pnei Moshe, it's as if to say, how can you deprive me of this mitzvah for even a moment? And the Mara Fulda brings up another explanation about this, where he's saying that Rabbi Yochanan meant to criticize those who felt that one should not wear tefillin all day, but only when reciting the Shema and praying. So 
That's uh, a third interpretation of this. But nonetheless, uh, this statement about uh, the, the casket and uh, the, the Ten Commandments and the Ark is something that uh, is, is very agotic. Uh, the Yafe Mara says about that, that one might have, might have thought that Joseph's elevation to the position of the viceroy was not a result of his merit, but was merely Hashem's method of luring Joseph's father, Jacob, to Egypt, uh, or it was his method of saving the world from destruction from a famine. But we learn that really it's Joseph's ultimate honor uh, having you know his coffin travel next to the ark, and all of this resulted from his fulfillment with all the dictates of the Torah, so we may deduce that he actually merited rulership for that same reason, says the Yafe Mara. The Mara Fulda points out about this that Rabbi Yochanan referred to himself, who, as the head of the yeshiva, received honorable, comparable honor comparable to the royalty, and alter alternatively, he was referring to all of Israel who enjoyed the inherent honor of being able to cleave to Hashem as his chosen people. So you have no idea how valuable it is in the real world to be doing a mitzvah even for a split second. Even doing tefillin for a split second has an immeasurable impact on the worlds above and it's something that these masters were able to perceive from their learning, from their wisdom. And it's something that if you can't see it, the problem is with you. You just didn't toil in learning enough so that, you know, sorry to say, but you're a bit ignorant and you don't know enough. So only to the people who toil and toil and toil and dedicate them to long hours every day of Torah study, can they start to develop the eyes and the spiritual eyes to be able to perceive and understand how this connects to reality and connects them to reality and it ele how it elevates. So this shows how the behavior of somebody who is so learned and so wise, how they know what this really means and how they're always rushing to try to always be doing this mitzvah. That's why we have to really toil. We have to really, you know, struggle to try to elevate our Torah learning. And if something seems silly to you about this, the problem's with you. So the problem's not with the tefillin. The problem's not with the mitzvah. The problem's with you. You just didn't learn enough. So the Gemara now is going to talk about the blessings when you put over the tefillin. And the Gemara says, in what manner does one recite blessings over the tefillin? And Rabbi Zerikon says in the name of Rabbi Yaakov bar Idi, when one places tefillin on the hand, what blessing does he say? Does he say? It is the following blessing. It says, blessed are you, and then it says to Hashem, that it says then, you know, the, the king of God, king of the universe, who sanctified us with his mitzvot and commanded us regarding the commandment of tefillin. So, again, I'm not saying this as uh, to use Hashem's name in vain. I'm using this to read what the text says for the purpose of trying to teach what the Gemara and the proper logic of what this is. So I'm not trying to use this to use Hashem's name in vain. I'm just trying to uh, go over what it is for the Shear. Anyway, fine point about that. According to the Bavli in Menachos 36a, the blessing is recited when um, when that's put on the head. And the blessing recorded there for the hand uh, is to put on tefillin. So the Gemara is going to proceed to give a variation of that blessing for the head. And you have to you have to look at the Shulchan Aruch to know what is going to be uh, what it is. Uh, Lamaisa. That means that what do we actually do today? 
There are always going to be variations in uh, the halachot or in the, the brachos in, in the Yershami. That'll be a little bit different than the Bavli because of the tradition. We always follow the Bavli except in the cases where we have uh, Masekto in, um, in, in Zerayim that we don't have in the Bavli. For instance, in like Meiser Shini. Uh, also, another case where we'll follow the Yershami and not the Bavli is be a, where there'll be a case where maybe there'll be a rectification puzzle. A lot of times uh, there'll be uh, systems to fix uh, something that's blemished that will be in the Yershami, but it won't be mentioned in the, in the, it'll be in the Yershami, but it won't be mentioned in the Bavli. And I was talking to the Rosh Kolel about that. He also agrees that in all of those cases where those rectification formulas are given in the Yershami, uh, but they're not given in the Bavli, that we're always going to go by the Yershami on it. But in this case, where you have a difference in the text versus the Bavli, we're going to always prefer the Bavli on it. Um, but nonetheless, this is what the Gemara says, and this is what the tradition of Eretz Yisrael was. But always follow your prayer book and always follow Shulchan Aruch for how it works, Halahala Misa. Anyway, the Gemara continues, it says, when he places tefillin on the head, what blessing does he say? It is the following. Blessed are you, that could be to Hashem's name, you know, our God, King of the Universe, who sanctified uh, his mitzvot and commanded us regarding the mitzvah of putting on tefillin. So that, by the way, is going to be uh, where you're putting on the hand and the head, and th that's going to be two separate mitzvot, so that if somebody uh, has only one to fill in, he uh, he dons it uh, one by himself, and then uh, so basically you have to keep in mind that to fill in is really going to be two separate uh, mitzvot because the Torah writes it that to put it on your arm and then put it on your head, uh, you know between your on your arm and between your eyes, and so then. That's basically counting as two, and so uh, this is this is going to be a reason why you have to have two, you know, tefillin. There's one for your arm, one for your head, and why it counts as two mitzvot, and why these have two different brachas. Mark continues says when he removes the tefillin, what blessing does he say? Basically, what it's going to be asking is, you know, in talking about, it's going to be saying the following. It says that it says you know blessed. And then it's going to talk about Hashem's name, you know, who sanctified us with his commandments, and commanded us to observe his decrees. So this is going to be right from Exodus 13, 10, where it's going to say, you shall observe this decree as at its designated time uh, from day to day. And basically what this is saying is that, you know, the mitzvah of tefillin is only going to be in the day and not going to be at night. By the way, one of the other things about taking off the tefillin is that um, you have to take the head off first and then the arm. Uh, the Gemara says that you get a, a big problem in Shemayim if you take off the arm first and then the head. So be careful. Anyway, the Gemara now wants to talk about the requirement for the last part. And it says, Gemara says, and this follows the opinion of the one who said that the verse where it says you shall observe this decree at its designated time from day to day speaks about the decree of tefillin and that's going to teach that the mitzvah is only by the day and not by the night. And the Gemara says, but according to the opinion of the one who said that the verse speaks about the decree of making the Pesach offering, that this rule is not correct. In other words, it's saying that if it does not refer to a designated time for removing tefillin, then no blessing is recited upon the removal at the end of the day. So the paradigm about this says the following, says that according to Rabbi Akiva, who interprets the above verse as referring to the Pesach offering and not the tefillin, the Torah does not stipulate here that tefillin be worn uh, by day and not by night. Rather, under biblical law, they are worn even at night, 
and it is the rabbis who decreed that tefillin be removed at nightfall due to the concern that one may fall asleep in his tefillin and not maintain a clean body. In other words, he may pass gas while he's sleeping. So you see really the, the holiness of tefillin and how you have to be very careful about the mitzvah. And by the way, it's very serious to uh, degrade something that's holy. Things you know in holiness can only go up in holiness. It's always a principle in Judaism that you know, you're never allowed to let things go down in levels of holiness. So doing something that takes down the level of holiness with you being in your tefillin is something that's very serious because you're violating that rule of taking something down in the level of holiness. So the Gemara is going to talk about a related teaching. Rabbi Abahu said in the name of Rabbi Elazar, one who puts on tefillin at night transgresses a positive commandment. And what is the scriptural basis for this rule? Which, which, in other words, is asking, what positive commandment do you transgress? And the Gemara says, you shall observe this decree at its designated time from day to day. In other words, this decree is going to be a reference of tefillin. And that, by the way, is going to be focused on one of the Tanayim that's specifically going to be Rabbi uh, Yose Haglili, and basically uh, Rabbi Abahu is going to be following that, uh, who, who interprets the, the verse in that way. So the, the Gemara is, is going to continue, and it's going to say that, moreover, today comes to exclude Shabbat and festivals from the mitzvah of tefillin. And basically what this is saying is that one who puts on tefillin at night or on the festival, or on the Shabbos, transgresses a commandment. And uh, basically, this is pointing out that you should not be wearing tefillin on Shabbat, and also other times. You have to wear it at its correct time, and there's a, a Torah rule on how we know you have to wear it at its designated time, because it says, you shall observe this decree at its designated time. So when when the Shabbat comes, you're not allowed to put on your tefillin. You're not allowed to do it on Yom Tov. And basically, the Torah is urging somebody to observe a positive commandment. And, you know, that's, you know, basically here going to be that, you know, you know, if somebody... Um, were to violate that positive commandment and do a dafka on Shabbat, he would basically be transgressing a positive commandment because he's putting it on at the wrong time. So that's a, a, a very important thing to note in Judaism is that Judaism has things with timing. And so if you didn't do the mitzvah at the right time, in a way, you just didn't do the mitzvah. But what this is showing is that actually you may have actually just violated the Torah and violated a positive commandment. And that is always going to be something that's very serious. So you have to do things at the right time. And we know that from Shira Shirim, that there's a time for everything. Basically, that there's a time for everything. And so over here, there's a time for mitzvahs. And there's a time for you to put on your tefillin. The Gemara is going to ask a question about you know, whether Rabbi Abahu actually said this. Kamar says, but Rabbi Abahu himself would sit and learn at night with his tefillin on him. And the Kamar is going to answer. It's going to say, his tefillin were actually placed to the side and not in the place where the mitzvah dictates that they are positioned. And they were, in effect, being held by him in that position for safekeeping until the next morning. So, Effectively, uh, he was not actually wearing his tefillin because they they were held or wrapped on his hand for safekeeping, and it was on the on the head. It was not worn in the position of doing the mitzvah. So really, it's it's ready for him, but and that way he doesn't lose a moment or an instant to do this mitzvah. He's always running after trying to do a mitzvah, and that's because he knows how valuable the mitzvah of tefillin is. 
And that's something that if you want to know, you have to toil in Torah so that you can learn why this mitzvah is so deep. The Gemara is going to give it another answer. It's going to say that there are those who wish to say the following explanation about Rabbi Abahu and how he would sit and learn at night with a tefillin on him. The Gemara says that uh, he said only that one who put one who initially puts on tefillin at night transgresses a positive commandment, but if the tefillin were on him from the daytime and night fell, it is permitted for him to continue wearing him wearing it. So there's a there's an idea says says the Rambam in in Hilchos Tefillin in chapter four Halacha ten, and it says that uh, when the Torah states that you shall guard this decree at its designated time, it's teaching that the mitzvah of Tefillin should be fulfilled only in the daytime, and it means that. Uh, it means merely that donning to fill it, in other words, putting it on um, and, and, and wearing it, uh, is permitted by day but not by night. And wearing to fill in where it's already been on you, uh, but then it falls into night. Uh, so wearing to fill in that were put on by the day is permitted even by night. So that's a, a fine point there on, on how this works. And again, if you want to know the halacha lemaisa for for this or anything, always check the Shulchan Aruch. So, the Gemara now wants to give another scriptural basis for excluding the Shabbat and festivals of, from Tefillin. And the Gemara says that uh, there were those who wished to say that we could derive it from the following verse. And the Gemara says, "And it, the Tefillin, shall be a sign for you." That's going to be in Exodus 13, 9. And basically, this is teaching that, you know, each of the tefillin must be worn on a day when it is your sign. In other words, to allegiance to Hashem. And the Gemara continues and says, Excluded, therefore, are festivals, the Shabbat, which are uh, in their entirety, entirety a sign of the bond between the Jews and Hashem. In other words, what this is saying, says the Rosh Cerulio, is that on weekdays, Jews must fix a sign onto themselves as a reminder that they hold fast to the Torah of Hashem and to fill in are that sign. But regarding the Shabbos, the Torah states explicitly, it is a sign between me, being Hashem, and you, the Jewish people. So, says the Rosh Cerulio, Festivals are also considered a sign because of the essence of the sign on the Shabbos is one's observing the prohibition of labor, through which he is reminded of Hashem's presence. And Yom Tov has the same restrictions on labor, so it always serves as a constant reminder of his presence. And the Or Chaim in 31.1 says that since the Shabbat and festivals are themselves signs, donning tefillin on those days would indicate that their sign is inadequate, and this would constitute a disparagement of their sign. So donning the tefillin on the Shabbos and the Yom Tov is prohibited. So if you always wanted to know why don't we wear tefillin on Shabbos, this is why. And we have a scriptural source for that in the Torah, too. And that's what makes this so strong. Now, the Gemara is going to ask, and it's going to say, but is it not so that we already derived this law from that which is written elsewhere, where it says, you shall observe this decree at its designated time from day to day? In other words, they're saying that, you know, why isn't it, why is it this one about it being a sign? Why isn't it saying that we already know about the decree from its designated time from day to day? So basically what it's asking is, why is another scriptural source necessary? And the Gemara is going to respond to that. It's going to say, you have no explanation for this except for that which Rabbi Yochanan said, where it says, any law that is not explicit in the Torah but must be derived through exegesis, we support it with inferences from many places in Scripture. So the Haredim says about this that the fact that 
uh, there is more than one source does not present a difficulty since each verse merely contains an asmata, an illusion that supports the law, uh, and it does not come primarily to teach this law. So that's a, a deep point about that. Now, the Gemara wants to go back to a related law on tefillin. And it says, we learned there in a Mishnah, that's going to be coming up in Berachot Halacha 3, uh, chapter 3, Halacha 3. And we learned there in a Mishnah, women and Canaanite slaves are exempt from reciting the Shema and from putting on tefillin. And from where is it derived that women are exempt from the mitzvah of tefillin? And it says, uh, it is stated in the Torah, and you shall teach them, this is the words of the Torah, to your sons. That's going to be over in Devarim 1119. And the Gemara says that that implies, but not to your daughters. In other words, what this is saying is, that we learn that women are exempt from the mitzvah of studying Torah and also the mitzvah of tefillin, which is linked to the mitzvah of studying Torah. And uh, although, you know, says the Or Chaim 47.7, although women are required to study the laws of Torah that are incumbent on them so that they may know how to observe the laws properly, they are not the subject uh, to the mitzvah of studying Torah for its own sake. But I just want to point out something else that for all the women out there, that women do get credit for learning Torah because guess what? When you help your son get ready for for Hader so he can go and learn Torah, you have that merit. And when you make your husband a breakfast in the morning so he has a lot of energy to learn in the yeshiva or the kolel in the morning, uh, guess what? You, you get you get that credit. And if your husband is not learning Torah, then the woman doesn't get credit for learning Torah in, in Shemayim. But if the husband is, she gets that credit. So, by the way, if the husband's a little bit lazy and a little bit, you know, a slacker and he, he's the kind of guy who's always drinking coffee and smoking cigarettes and he's talking to his friends at the yeshiva and he's not really learning so much, by the way, if he's being paid to do that, it may be Gezel. But anyway, um, guess what? She, the wife, still gets the credit, even though he, the guy who's sitting there talking to his friends, smoking cigarettes, drinking coffees outside, who's not really learning. He's there at the building, but he's not learning. Uh, he doesn't get the credit, but she does. So that's something important to notice. And also, uh, there's a there's a big link to uh, learning Torah. Now, women will come along and say, but I'm modern and I'm feminist. Why can't I learn? And the answer is, you can. You can open up and you can learn laws that are related to you. Open up the Shulchan Aruch. You can learn about keeping Shabbat better. You can learn about the laws of Pesach and Hanukkah. You can learn about the laws of Loshan Hara and how to have good Derech Eretz. You can learn about how how a marriage should work and things for Shalom Bite. Uh, by the way, you can also read the Sinarena and you can also read uh, the Midrashim. In fact, Rabbi Horowitz, the Rosh Hashiva says, is very good for, for women to learn Midrash Rabbah because it gives them a lot of faith and it's a good thing for a husband and a wife to read together on Shabbat. Uh, to do some learning together for Midrash Rabbat. He says it's a very good thing to do. And uh, it gives a woman more chizuk and strength and amuna. So that's a, a, per, a totally permissible thing. But, you know, a woman doesn't need to uh, sit there and study about the halachot, about figs. That's, that's for something that, you know, is for the man. And men and women are uh, both important and uh, but but the roles are different. Uh, there's another thing that, you know, women are also allowed to learn Musar books and, you know, always, you know, trying to learn books about how to have better speech and how to have more modesty is always a good thing. Anyway, the Gemara is going to continue. It's going to say that, you know, we derive that 
only one who is obligated in Torah study is obligated in tefillin, and it follows that women who are not obligated in Torah study are not obligated in tefillin. So basically, the mitzvah of tefillin is going to be juxtaposed um, between um, over here with learning and over here with Torah study. That's going to be a heckish, and that's how we're making this this connection. In other words, you know, one might be wondering, you know, why do we rely on a hekesh between tefillin and Torah in order to show that there's an exemption for women from tefillin? Uh, so, you know, why, you know, why would that be? And you can find out more answers about that in the Bavli and Kiddushin 34a. Uh, but there is a hekesh, and this is the tradition, and this you know, our traditions go all the way back to, to Moshe Rabbeinu, and this is just the way it is. So our traditions are standing, and they're binding, and you shouldn't tamper with them. They should be left alone. So uh, there's going to be a challenge about a woman who wore tefillin, and the Gemara says that they challenged this ruling as follows. It said, why was it taught in a brisa Michal, the daughter of a Kushite, that's going to be King Shaul, used to put on tefillin. And the wife of Jonah, the prophet, used to go up to the temple on the pilgrimage festivals of Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot, and the sages did not protest against them. In other words, what this is saying is that since the sages did not protest Michal's uh, donning of tefillin, we see that women, you know, may be obligated to the mitzvah in in some sort of way. Um, I just want to point out that, you know, women also, you know, there's a question about, you know, the mitzvah of going up to the temple on the pilgrimage festivals, because over there it explicitly says in Devarim in 1616, it says, you know, three times a year, all your males appear before Hashem, your God. So, that's going to be a, a, a mitzvah for the men, not for the women. And if a woman does it, uh, she gets some sort of credit. But because it's, you know, obligatory for a man to do it, the credit that he gets is much higher. So in, in each of those cases, you know, you would have expected the sages would have protested on the woman's uh, performance of the mitzvah. But actually, that's going to get explained here. The Gemara is actually going to explain what happened. The Gemara answers. Rabbi Chizkiah said in the name of Rabbi Abahu, Jonah's wife actually was turned back from the temple when she attempted to go there on pilgrimage. So um, so women, women do have uh, special roles and special mitzvahs. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, as we see here, uh, Jonah's wife was uh, was stopped from going up, and um, so you know because uh, women are exempt from the mitzvah of going up to the temple, the sages deemed it improper for them to go there, and this is because one who goes up on pilgrimage must bring along the offering, and since women are exempt from that particular offering, her animal is actually just hulin, uh, which you know, one may not bring as an offering in the temple courtyard. So uh, even if she intends for her offering to be uh, donated, then what happens there is that she actually just creates this impression of bringing Hulin into the courtyard, and it's confusing to the people. So they wouldn't, they wouldn't allow that. What about Mahal? And... Gamar says, and with respect to Michal, the daughter of a Kushite, the sages, basically they're saying that she was, uh, you know, from Shal Melech, the sages actually did not protest against her, and they stopped her from donning the tefillin. So the, uh, the Or Chaim in 38.3 says that, although the ton of the above Barisa states that the sages did not protest. The Tana of the Mishnah disputes the version of the story and holds that the sages did protest Michal's practice. Thus, 
biblical law uh, exempts women from donning tefillin, and a rabbinical decree prohibits them from putting on tefillin. So the Haredim uh, states that about this, that the reason women may not uh, put on tefillin is that by performing this mitzvah, they would give the impression of rejecting the words of the scriptural interpretations of the sages who are expounding the scripture as exempting women. And accordingly, the Haredim notes that women are restricted from performing any mitzvah from which they are biblically exempt. And he says that many Rishonim, however, maintain that women are generally permitted to uh, voluntarily perform mitzvahs uh, that are caused by time, like blowing the shofar in Rosh Hashanah, uh, but they are restricted from performing such mitzvahs only in, in exceptional cases, such as to fill in where there's a strict requirement to maintain a clean body. Uh, so anyway, uh, that's, that's some of what's going on over here. But the women that are, are eager today to try to, to put on tefillin in the, in the uh, Western Wall, these, these, these modern, confused, uh, misguided women that don't know anything about the Torah, Effectively, what they're trying to do is they're, they're rejecting the words of the scriptural interpretations of this by the sages. And they're trying to undo the tradition that we have going back all the way since uh, the Gedolim here and all the way back since Moshe Rabbeinu. So um, this, is, uh, this is really their attempt. Um, they, they really are trying to undermine uh, how the sages are saying this. And uh, that's, that's really the problem, is that um, they're not doing it because they're looking at a, a heter on it. Really, the reason they're doing it is dafka to undermine uh, the interpretations of the sages. And that's a serious problem. So the Gemara now wants to talk about the bathhouse and the laws there, and it was taught uh, about the bathhouse that uh, these are the rules for one who enters a bathhouse concerning the area where people stand with their clothes. That's going to be the outermost room. Um, reciting the Shema and prayers are going to be allowed there. Gamar says that, and needless to say, gathering one's fellow is allowed there, or greeting one's fellow is allowed there. And the Gemara says that one may put on tefillin in that room. And needless to say, one does not need to remove his tefillin upon entering it. The Gemara says that concerning the area where it is common for most of the people to stand naked in the innermost room, greeting one's fellow is not allowed there. The Gemara says that needless to say, reciting the Shema and prayer is forbidden there. And one removes his tefillin upon entering that room. Gemara says that, needless to say, one does not put on tefillin there. And concerning the area where some of the people are naked and some of them are clothed in the middle of the room, greeting one's fellow uh, is allowed there, but reciting the Shema and the prayer is not allowed there. And one does not have to remove his tefillin upon entering that room, but one does not put on, put them on there in the first place. So... Uh, basically, says Arash Cerulio that since the middle of the room is in the middle room is considered a bathhouse only in a limited sense, one who enters that room already wearing tefillin does not have to remove them. But uh, if he was not wearing tefillin, he should not put them on there until he reaches the outer room. So tomorrow we're going to get into more things about the uh, the tefillin and. We're going to get into some amazing things so we can start to understand some of the depth of tefillin and why it's so important. But it's very important to always follow the sages and that what you can see here is that we have a, a very old tradition and, you know, this is the way it is. And, you know, this is because this goes back um, all the way back to a very ancient time, like to Moshe Rabbeinu. And, you know, in the meantime, you know, 
the, the way things are working for the roles of men and women uh, are defined by the sages, and we shouldn't tamper with that. And as for modern feminism, if you want to know more about uh, modern feminism, I highly recommend you go look at the Shirim by the Lubavitch Rebbe, who gives a great shear explaining about the, the dangers and the perils of uh, feminism and why it's misguided. And in my own personal experience, I think that the women that are going to go for more traditional types of roles are going to be happier. And I think that the women who are going to go more and more toward feminism are ultimately going to be less and less happy. And I think that will always be the case. And I think that part of that is because you're undermining the initial creation. And the initial creation is where a woman comes from a man, and a man has certain roles, and also in the curse that Hashem gives from the Garden of Eden, it's specified toward a man's certain roles. And the curse that a woman gets is toward a woman's certain roles. And the roles of where a man and a woman were created from is different. And how they are created is different. And there's a Midrash Rabbah in Bereshit that says that when a man and a woman are together, that the, the man looks down because he's looking at where he comes from, which is the earth. And the woman is looking up because she's looking at where she comes from, which is the man's rib. A man and a woman are different and have different roles. And you have to respect that. And Judaism is structured that way. And if you want to have a happier life, you want to have a life that has more fulfillment, you have to fulfill your role for how you were created. And that is going to bring a, a more well-rounded, deeper sense of fulfillment. Have a great day.